going to remember that last class when we were in uh, Revelation chapter 5, we got our first glimpse of Jesus, but he wasn't called Jesus, he was called the Lamb. It's the same person. And he, and people were weeping, and get this, they were weeping in heaven. Yeah, that's what it says. They were weeping in heaven because the only hope you have, not just in uh, the earth, but in heaven, is the Lamb. And so they're all going, well, who can, who, why, you know, how are we going to do this? What's the deal? <clears throat> and of course, they said, uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. And when he turned to see the one with the label, the one with the label lion of the tribe of Judah, they were immediately confronted with the reality that what he was, not just a label, what he was by nature is the lamb, and, and the way that wording was, was the lamb slain. Or, if you remember, we talked about it being a lamb slaughtered. And that's the true, that's the true translation. <clears throat> um, and there was um, sort of a marveling going on as they began to realize the true nature, the true nature of the one that has won the victory. And, and you know, they were, they're, they're singing that, but I don't think that we realize it. But I mean, they're singing, you know, that he was, you know, uh, worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered. I mean, this is, this is heavenly worship. This is the highest worship. You're worshiping something that got defeated. And yet, by that very defeat, <clears throat> did win. By that very defeat, did win and did um, uh, do more than all of the armies that stood for God or all of the, you know, weapons that we could forge to stand up for our rights, whether it be a nation, as a nation that, you know, you know, has the wherewithal to build weapons literally of mass destruction to destroy our enemies, or ourselves as an individual, what kind of weapons can we forge? Not physical. But what kind of weapons can we devise, can we dream up to defeat our enemies? to undermine them, to overthrow them, to, <clears throat> to win, to win. And, you know, I don't know, I don't know, honestly, I don't know how many of us really think about this. I mean, I do because the Lord's constantly dealing with me over this reality of, of who my understanding of God is now. <clears throat> But it makes me cognizant of when I am seeking or doing, using weapons to get my way to <clears throat> uh, look, look good or look better than someone else or to make them look worse than me. Maybe it's not even to make me look better than them. Maybe it's just to make them look worse than me. Um, I mean, you know, there are people that hang out with certain people because they, they think it makes them look better than the people they hang out with, you know? Well, okay. I don't know if that's common. I just know that that's it's just 
to the lamb, anyway, that's such a foreign thought because he, when he says take the lower seat, he doesn't think we're going to do that in and of ourselves. We're not going to do that. We want the highest seat. I mean, that's just a fact. I mean, there's nothing, you know, that shouldn't be a surprise to any of us. <laughs> you know, that's just the way we are. <clears throat> so when he says that, he knows that, number one, he's talking about himself. That's who he's talking. I'm going to do this. You know, I'm going to, you know, he's telling them to take the lower seat, and he's going, okay, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to come under, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be crucified in between two thieves. <laughs> Guilt by association. Among all the other things. <clears throat> and so... We are in Revelation 5, and if we are the seven churches, if you understand what I mean, we're part of that <clears throat> completed church, just like those actual seven churches. They are confronted with a heavenly reality that is not what they were, I could say, not, they certainly weren't expecting it, and maybe not even wanting it, because they're so beat down, because they're so met much problems because the devil just seems to be running rampant within the seven churches, remember? The reading of chapter 2 and 3. And, um, <clears throat> okay, so our first early, not the, not the first actual, but the early encounters with the Lamb, whether by teaching or the Lord speaking to us or whatever, reading in the Word or the Lord talking to us. You know, ju the, the first thing we have to do is just get over the fact that it's a slaughtered lamb that's being worshipped with the highest praise. Um, we have to get over that, and then, we, then we're not like that when we see it. You know what I'm saying? When we see Jesus like that, in the early stages, <clears throat> maybe early to mid <laughs> stages, we're not like that. <laughs> maybe early to mid to late. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we're not like that. <clears throat> uh, it takes a while for us even to want to be like that. I mean, you know. It, it, it just does because several reasons. Number one, because nobody wants the answer to be that victory comes through your defeat. Nobody wants that. Everybody wants to really stomp on the enemy. <clears throat> the other reason is, is because nine times out of 10 or 90 time, 99 out of 100, our concepts of what lamb or Christ crucified means usually isn't right. It's usually, it's usually a defensive reaction of self. That's our reaction. That's what we're getting. So you can't really go by that, although we totally go by that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We totally do because that's what we think it means and we're scared or we don't want it. It's only... It's really only as the Holy Spirit begins to uh, make inroads. You know, you remember Jesus said, you know, this is the new covenant I will make with that after those days. I will take away the stony heart. Well, it seems to be taking a while to get that stony heart away, but, <clears throat> and he has to find these little inroads into that stony heart, but he does, the Holy Spirit if anybody can do it, the Holy Spirit can do it. <laughs> Thank God. And, and so, um, so ultimately, we have nothing to fear if we can do that thing that we do around here a lot. And that is, it, ultimately, we, we don't have to fear if we can say, Lord, I'm not willing, but I'm willing for you to make me willing. You know what I mean? You all know how we've done that time and time again and probably saved our lives. Oh, you know, so many times. Well, but that's a good thing, really, ultimately, because then it puts it in the hands of the Holy Spirit. 
And we're kind of saying, we, you know, what, what's funny is when we pray that, we're looking at ourselves and we're thinking, I'm so hard, I don't even know if you can, right? I mean, anybody ever prayed that and thought, man, I don't even know if you can. That's the way we're praying it. But the way that he's taken it is that, you know, you're putting it in the hands of God. You're putting it in the hands of the Spirit whose job is to do that. I mean, he's good. <laughs> it's, I'm just going to say it like that. He's really, really good. And it may take a while, but, you know, boy, when uh, it's kind of like Samson pulling down the house of the, all of the kings of uh, the Philistines, when it, co when it goes down, it goes down. It goes down. <clears throat> and... And usually our fears are greater about how hard we are than our faith is about how good he is. <laughs> but it really doesn't matter because either way we still put it in his hands. So we're in good hands, but only with the Holy Spirit. All right, so this... this um, <clears throat> This initial encounter with the Lamb for the seven churches is incredibly powerful. We have to see that because that's really the Lamb we're supposed to be seeing. We have to see him totally exalted above everything else. Thou art worthy. You alone are worthy. Uh, you have to see that all that is godly in heaven and all that is supernatural and all that is glorious and all that is holy and all that is, you know, all the directions you want to go with the height of heaven is focused in on the lamb. And, and touting a slaughtered lamb as, you did it, yeah, you, you, you got really beat up bad and died. And yet, that's exactly what they're touting as the victory when you listen to them. That I was slain, and by thy blood, you know, da-da-da-da, you, know, <laughs> you know, by your blood, you know. And it's talking about the loss of blood. It's talking about being smitten to such a degree that you are bleeding out your life blood. <clears throat> All right. So I want to read a few scriptures here. And then I want to reinstate some of the things that we have settled some time back, but we need to resettle um, in this class. But if you will, um, Revelation 13, did I tell you to go there? Revelation 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Okay, well, that's scary enough right there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, if this was a horror movie and you had the right music going, it would, you know, you know how it goes. You know, it, it would scare the fool out of you. All right. Uh, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. All right. You can take from this description that this, this is probably not your friend. <laughs> okay. You can pretty much settle that. He's got blasphemy written all over him. Okay. And you, you, you... Foolish one that you are have sided with the little lamb, little tiny lamb that's slaughtered, not just a tiny lamb that's going to run out there and go, I'll, I'll do it, you know. <laughs> I'll, beat it, I'll beat him up. But a slaughtered version of the tiniest of lamb. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power and his throne 
and great authority. All right, well, we've, if you've read, you know, Book of Revelation, you've already been introduced to the dragon, <clears throat> which is, um, you know, what is it? What that, let's see if I can even find it right here. I thought it might be right here. The, the dragon, the, the devil, Satan, the deceiver, the accuser of the brethren. All of those names are used, used of him, particularly in the book of Revelation. And he's giving, you know, we already got this beast coming out of the water. But the dragon's giving him power too, and he's already got, a, you know, he's already got, you know, ten heads or ten horns and, you know, seven heads and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> now we got the great red dragon helping him out. All right, lamb folk, lamb flock, how you feeling? Huh? Yes, yeah, super confident. Well said, Lindsay. As her voice goes, <laughs> super confident. <laughs> All right. Then verse 3. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we know. And I saw one of his heads as though it had been wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worship the dragon who gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? All right, let's go over to chapter 11 now. <clears throat> let's make sure that we catch this. You may ask a question. You may not get an answer, but you may ask. I think so. I think so. That's my that it, that it is alluding to his power and to the degree that his power is unstoppable, greater than anything around. All right. So Revelation 11, verse 7, and um, let's see, gosh. Okay, and when the, I've, I wrote over my Bible words, so I can't even read the Bible. I can only see my words, and they're stupid. <clears throat> okay, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended up out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and shall kill them. All right, so here you have the war going on. There's the only real war that is mentioned that I, I can see in the book of Revelation, or at least certainly the primary one that keeps uh, being alluded to throughout, is the great red dragon, either after the man-child or the, the, the one who gave birth to it, or the beast after those who serve the Lord. It's, it's sort of the beasts of the world trying to kill the lambs of the world. And the, the scripture has already said, and we've read in several different times over some, the course of these classes, how they just keep making war with the saints. Making war with the saints. And, but who, but who, is able to make war. All right. So it's like, or it would be a little bit like a, a little flock of believers 
seeing the, this beast rise up out of the sea, the scary enough, then the dragon, who's even bigger than him, gives him power to go make war. And somebody says, you know, kind of like some of you have been around during the Iraq beginning war and all that, you know, war, it's war, war has started. Well, when you're just a little flock and it's saying war has started, you're kind of going, oh my God, war has started. They've declared war on us. <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> now, I'm saying all that to try to set the stage a bit <clears throat> for the storyline throughout the book of Revelation. Because what you're going to find out, what we'll go through, and we'll, we'll just divide this thing up, we're going to find out that all of this imagery that Jesus has given to John to give to the seven churches is impossible situations, is not just, well, we, we might, we're, we're, it's not just, well, we're, outnumbered two to one. It's, it's impossible odds. Okay? Um, I, remember, I remember one time when we were, we were over on um, Maple Street and the church was over there and um, the elders met with me and they said, we got this problem and, you know, and man, it's just bad and it just got real bad and it looks like, we're, man, we're going to go under and we need a miracle. And I said to him, well, then it's a good thing we serve a God of miracles. You know, but I thought, you know, if it was a church service and I'd say, we serve a God of miracles, we'd go, yeah. We go into a little back room and discuss business and how bad things are at. And nobody brings up, we, you know, yeah, we serve a God of miracles. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, I didn't, th they were kind of like, oh, I didn't think of that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Well, that's none of our elders that are here, here now. So uh, what I want to do is I'd like for us to go to the Gospel of Matthew real quick and just take a look in chapter 26 at some things. It would be uh, Matthew 26, starting with verse... 66, so it'd be Matthew 2666. Six, six. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> before I do that, um, I want to remind you of the hidden wisdom of God. I want to remind you of what 1 Corinthians declared to us to be the, the power of God was Christ crucified. Christ crucified, he says, the wisdom and the power of God. Christ crucified. Christ defeated. Christ mistreated. I mean, hear what I'm saying. And I hope before I get through this class to have a particular class on the difference between what we're teaching here and the concept of nonviolence because there's a, there's a huge difference. <clears throat> but um, the very things that we're going to read here is what the rest of, is what the epistles are teaching was the power of God. That's it right there, okay? The things we're going to be reading about Jesus' crucifixion. Now, I was taught... <clears throat> I was taught when I was a young Christian that Jesus died and he went down into hell and he beat the devil up. And he came back with the victory. Folks, the devil wasn't in hell then. <laughs> he's not in hell now. Up to this point, he's never been in hell. So if Jesus went down there, he didn't get a chance to meet with him. Can I get amen? He didn't get a chance to meet with him. Much less beat him up. 
The victory was the cross. And, that, and the scriptures declare that, that over and over and over again, that the cross was where he was defeated. At the cross, he defeated the enemy and made a show of him openly. But you have to see the wisdom of God. You have to understand the power of God. And if you don't, I mean, I'm just asking, how, how do we claim to be Christians if we don't understand the power of God and the wisdom of God? I mean, those are, wouldn't you say those are pretty important things to understand if you're going to know God? Well, a lot of people say, I know the power of God. The power of God, lay hands on the sick and bat, come out. And the demon, you know, comes out of them and there's the power of God. But the scriptures declare, and most of that stuff, you know, was going on in the gospels, but the scriptures declare that the cross is the power of God now. All right? <clears throat> so, I want to read these things and I want to read it. I want you to think in terms of we're here in the victory. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Um, verse 66, what think ye? And they answered and said, this talking about Jesus when he's being on trial. He is guilty of death. Guilty of death. All right. Now, I want you also to consider yourself being in a situation where, you know, um, there's an old saying that the, that, the, that the time ought to fit the crime. Meaning, if you did something little, then you get a little bit of time in jail. If you've done something big, you get, you know. They're saying, you know, now, remember, Jesus has never been arrested before. This is his first offense. Yeah, first time offender, okay. You have to keep that in mind. <clears throat> and what are they accusing him of? But they go, no, he's guilty of death. All right. Would that hit you in the gut over some little issue when people start rising up? You better believe it would. Then they spat in his face. That's the next verse. I'm reading the next verse. Then they spat in his face. <laughs> okay. Well, it's one thing to have a just trial, it's another thing to be able to ridicule and, you know, uh, you know, tear down someone like that. <clears throat> they spat in his face and they buffeted him and others smote him with the palms of their hand. Okay, they're slapping him in the face. The good news is they're getting spit all over their hands. Oh, sorry, sorry. Slip back into the wisdom that isn't of God there for a moment. <laughs> Saying, prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who smote thee? All right. So now they're mocking him. And so I just... Uh, I wrote a few things down here. Jesus was arrested, but then he was also convicted. And if you believe the testimony of the false witnesses at Jesus' trial, you'd be convinced that his crime was so bad that a sentence of death was justified, and finally he was crucified. All right. So this is, this is some powerful convincing of people. And then just in those few verses I wrote down, he is guilty of death. That means you deserve death. Whatever you are, we don't know, but you deserve death, okay? Uh, they spat in his face. They struck him, physical violence against him. Phys you know, they stripped him. That's also in there, not in those same verses, but they stripped him put a crown of thorns on his head. They mocked him. They crucified him between two thieves, like I said, guilt by association. And they said, you who would destroy the temple, they twisted his words to make him appear against them and against the things of God that, were long, that had been long been established. In other words, they're convincing everyone around that 
the words that he has spoken, he's against God. He's against our God. He's against what we love. And he's against long-established realities. Okay. Now, again, don't just think of Jesus. Think of that happening to you. When you know, I know Jesus isn't against God. It's his Father. Okay? I got a pretty good idea. He's more for God than they are. Right? Right. So, and I, got a, I also got a feeling that even in the middle of all this, he is the Lamb of God taking away their sin and working the very things that God wanted more than they are. They're working against what God wanted. <clears throat> okay. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. If you're on the other side and you have the wisdom of this world and not the hidden wisdom of God, then you're saying this is the right thing to do. This guy is causing problems. He's saying stuff that, that Moses wasn't true and that, you know, he's going to tear down our temple and you see what I'm saying? So this is the right thing to do. We need to stand up and do something. We need, to, we need to make a stand in this situation. We can't let people like this run around and just do stuff like this. We need to, you know, spit in their face and slap them and, <laughs> and mock them and stuff. And yet, believe it or not, if you were ever in that situation, you might get caught up in a mob mentality and feel the very same things. I might. Okay. All right. So, and then, uh, let's see, they were deriding him. And they said, save yourself. Save yourself. I wrote, they could not see his selflessness, but saw the cross as something to escape. All right, folks, that, that applies to every one of us at some point in our walk. We saw the cross as something to escape until God got our heart. <laughs> not something that you not only go through, but you know, willingly accept as the way of God to win the world. That's what Jesus did. That was his way that he won the world, you know. And he said, if my kingdom was of this world and it's not of this world, then I could have called 10,000 angels and, or my, my followers would have fought for, for it. All right. So they say, come down from the cross. Save yourself. Come down from the cross. All right. Only a son of God's going to stay up there. If you're the son of God, come down to the cross. Come down from the cross. But only a son of God is going to stay up there. Whether you're male or female, it's you being a son of God by Christ in you. Only a son of God's going to do that. Only a son of God by Christ. Only that which is mature in his spirit, not in deep knowledge, folks. It's being conformed to the image of Christ, not being conformed to the knowledge of Christ. Can I get an amen? Okay, now can I get an amen based on what I said? Because several of you looked like you were thinking about something else, and then you amen because I asked one. <laughs> I didn't ask for that. <clears throat> All right. Now, you know, I, 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 need, I need to move on, but this thing of come down from the cross, not realizing that that is the very thing that makes him God, and that's the very thing that hang, keeps him hung up there, not their nails. He could have easily just ascended off of that wasn't there nails that kept him on the cross? It was a reality that this is the power of God. You're in the middle of it. And, and, and Paul described it. He says that the very weakness of God is stronger than men. Meaning, here's God at his weakest. Slain, slaughtered lamb. God at his weakest. The weakness of God is stronger than all the power and all the political might and all the military might and all the religious might all joined together to destroy 
to destroy. Just like the beast. Just like the beast. Anybody getting a hint of what the rest of the book of Revelation is going to be about? Ready to destroy, and yet, in fact, in Revelation 11 there, when we read that, it says, and he made war with the saints and overcame them and killed them. Remember reading that? Well, we probably read that and go, this is terrible. We're losing. <laughs> you know, I mean, you read the book of Revelation, you go, doggone it. Come on, guys. <laughs> Jesus, well, don't worry. You can, you can get away with it now. But a few chapters down here, he's going to whoop your bohunkus. So, okay, we'll accept a little debt now. We'll give you a little bit. You can win. You know, you can take your shots. We don't even understand. The victory isn't at the end where everybody puts it in the book of Revelation. The victory is all through the book. It's incredible. And, and, and I, I, I'll make a little confession to you right now since this is a good time. It's all through the book. Remember I said that we were going to go through a bunch of that during this class or the next one. I'll be doggone. I studied, prepared, did all this stuff. Got ready to go, we're pulling out, and I said, Deb, wait a minute, let me just check to make sure I got those notes here. Because they're very technical in, in that they are comparing, you know what I mean? You have to see this, and then this, and then this. And you have to know the scriptures that, that do that jump. They weren't in my thing, so stop. Went all the way back upstairs, which for me is, takes a while, and it's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> I couldn't find those notes for the life of me. Never did find them. So I came back here and I'm sharing what I'm sharing. <laughs> but we, you know, we're, apparently we won't do it this class or the next class, but we'll do it the next one. And maybe the Lord knew that this needed to be a set stage to comprehend what we're going to see because what we're going to see is this picture in Matthew 26 and the victory of it repeated over and over in the book of Revelation. Okay. Repeated over and over in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> All right. So finally they said, you, you claim to be God You're, or you claim to be of God. Where is he? This proves that you, you were never of God. That's what they said to Jesus. The fact that you're still on this cross, you claim to be of God. Where is God now? Oh, he's right there. The clearest picture, the express image of him is hanging on the cross that you're saying, where is God? But you don't know God. You, could, you wouldn't recognize him. You're looking for something great. You're looking for a big splash. You're looking for something else. You're not looking for a slain lamb. You're not, you know, what are you, you're going to be shocked up in heaven. You're just going to be sitting there going, why are we worshiping this? Let's see some big time stuff. Let's see some fireworks up here. Not some bloodied old little lamb on a throne. That's not, is, that, is this really what heaven's about? But instead... <laughs> there you go. Yes, it is. Hallelujah. And certainly it is. The ones that understand, listen carefully, are going to be shouting, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Not just the lamb, folks. Worthy is that lamb that was slain. Is anybody on Skype shouting right now? Good for you folks. I thought I heard it all the way here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was like all capitals. <clears throat> all right, let me read a little bit. I don't want to get excited. Okay, so we just looked at all this horrible treatment that happened to Jesus. To present the horrible treatment Jesus suffered on the cross as described in Matthew 26 as the power of God is foolishness and ridiculous to the average mind. 
How many of you have an average mind? <laughs> it is especially viewed as folly when you contrast that scene with the power, rage, and resources of the beast in parts of the book of Revelation. The outward battle between a wild beast and a lamb would be no contest. Amen? But that is what that battle was about. And that's what every battle, basically, in the book of Revelation is about. <clears throat> and when the full force and unfolding of the power of the beast is released towards the lamb, he would seem weak and foolish when considered as a possible conqueror. I fear that some of us still think that it's that to embrace this thing, this slaughtered, foolish, ridiculous thing would be foolish, isn't that what it says? But the but they think it's foolish. They think it's foolishness. <clears throat> and they think it's weakness. But it is. It's the weakness of God that is more powerful than the, all the power of man. <clears throat> all right. So most would conclude that such a confrontation could only end in slaughter. And so it does. And so it does. However, what things that are contrary to our way of thinking in this scenario are perfectly in accord with the mind of Christ? Philippians chapter 2, anybody remember it? Or anybody know it? Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who thought it not something to be fought over to be equal with God but became like a man, became like a servant man, became a crucified man. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him. <clears throat> Most who are looking for a deliverer would be shocked to realize that the lamb enters the battle with the intention of losing it. You know? The lamb, the lamb, I don't know about you, but the lamb enters the battle with the intention of losing it. Just like he did on the cross. He lost it. No, he won it, but he lost. You understand? He defeated by being defeated. He conquered by being conquered. Uh, so, that, and I'm going to read that again. Most who are looking for a deliverer would be shocked to realize that the lamb enters the battle with the intention of losing it and by it ending with his own death. My intention is, and he told the disciples all along the way, look, I have to be shamefully treated. I have to da-da-da-da. I'm going to die. And what did Peter say? Not so, Lord. Folks, those don't go together. Not so and Lord don't go together. <laughs> There's some things that do. That doesn't. But the lamb has won the victory. He has defeated by being defeated. The winner of this battle is the victim. That's, that's a very popular name in the Hebrew of what the sacrifice was. Victim. Now, I don't think that word means as much to us today as it might have been other generations because today a victim is really someone who is full out self-pity and they did this to me and I'm the victim here and it's just totally not the lamb. But if you realize that Jesus was the one who was victimized and this, and this I'm going to give you a little hint now for some of the things we're going to see. This is how you can discern certain things in the book of Revelation when you realize that he was victimized. I'll say it like this. If it talks about they made war with him, it's the cross. Because he's being victimized by the greater power. All right, we'll, we'll get into that. <clears throat> um, and, but, but we have to know the signals. We have to know the signs before we're going to understand the book. Amen? <clears throat> All right. Um, 
how many of us who claim to be followers of the Lamb look forward to ex exercising this kind of power? Matthew 26 kind of power. And yet it is the power of God. Do you want, how many of you want the power of God? Glory to God, brothers and sisters. How many of you want the power of God? Come on, come up here and I'll lay hands on you. Whap! You know, I mean, that's the way they lay, you know, smote him and I'll spit in your face and I'll, you know what I mean? <laughs> there we'll see if you got the power of God. I wouldn't really do that. I'm trying to use that as a <laughs> spiritual example of what actually took place to Jesus. <laughs> All right. So many people look at this picture of Jesus on the cross and reject him for his lack of standing up against injustice. That is because they are probably in the process of suffering injustice themselves and are looking for a power that will reverse their situation. To them it is as if Jesus is not preventing oppression and the, and the inflicting of unjust suffering, but is passively allowing it and thereby condoning it. See, this is someone who, want, who has the, the attitude, outlook, and spirit of the beast, not of the lamb. Those who tend to reject the way of the lamb are those who wish to inflict the same kind of pain on others that they have afflicted and had done to themselves. I mean, I know, that. you say, how do I know this? Great wisdom from God came to me. Well, actually, no. That spirit was working in me, and I saw how contrary to the one I claim to love was right here, and that I'm a minister and a preach, preacher, and I don't need to be worried about everybody else. I need, to, I need Jesus. And thank God I want Jesus. <laughs> you know. We, I think we can all admit we need Jesus, amen? But do we all want Jesus <laughs> in this way? You know, that's, that's the thing. So, um, <clears throat> so they look at the lamb and boldly declare, this is not the lion of Judah, the conqueror. I'm talking about those who wish to inflict the same kind of pain that, they're, that the beast is inflicting on them. Following that? And there they look at the lion of the tribe of Judah and they say, This is not the conqueror, the lamb, you know, when they see the lamb. Right now, many of these people have no power to resist their oppressors, meaning they're being they're they're being they're under it. They're being oppressed, like the seven churches were, folks. Reread it if you need to, and see that it was a bad, dirty hard situation those seven churches were in. <clears throat> um, right now, many of these people have no power to resist their oppressors. And if they did have that power, they would use it in the same oppressive way toward their enemies. You know, you have treated me this way and now the tables are turned and you don't have the power, you don't have the control, I do, and you are going to suffer for what you did to me. Amen? How many of them would be open to the notion that they also need to be conquered because they're like the beast who now presently oppresses them? Well, okay. we we're not going to see that unless the Holy Spirit opens our eyes because our way of viewing things is based on the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, right? And so we go, well, we're good and they're evil. I mean, you know, you've heard me say this before, but the proof that we're good and they're evil is the book of Proverbs. Blessed is the man who loves the Lord, but the evil are like a swine. Well, we know, yeah, that's right. Well, we know that it's talking about them. It's never talking about us. We're always the righteous. It doesn't matter how many times it goes through that, we always identify with the righteous one. They're the bad ones. That's the knowledge of good and evil. I'm good, they're evil. 
See? Little do you know that the good person there is Jesus and you are the evil one. <laughs> you know? And the only way you can ever be over on that side is through oneness with the one, Jesus. It's the only way. And that oneness can't be theological or theoretical. It has to be actual like a branch is to a vine where the life and the nature will flow out of the vine into the branch so that the branch and vine now have the same life and that life that was in the vine before we ever connected up now is in us producing fruit and it's not our fruit so that we never have to work at trying to produce fruit. Our goal is to make sure we're f as a branch full of that life, Jesus. Amen? So it's kind of stupid to sit around and teach the fruit of the Spirit. Well, because it doesn't say it's your fruit. It says the, now the fruit of Randy you know what I mean? Or the fruit of a really good Christian is love and joy. <laughs> All right. So just in closing, this um, a real a real break <clears throat> a real break. The, and the beginning of a breakthrough for us to even consider these things usually has to come with some sort of crisis. Why? Because we're hard-headed. We're stiff-necked. We are. We are. We all are. We're that way. I believe that a person can hear this so often that they slowly actually get harder instead of softer. I believe that they just get, it's like water off a duck's back anymore. It doesn't even, doesn't phase them anymore. It's like, you know, oh yeah, amen, amen, whatever. You know, where's the passion for Jesus? Where's the, where's the absolute desire not, you know, I mean, it's like, well, let's go into all the world. You know, so, you know, somebody said that to me once. Well, why aren't we going all over the world and getting, you know, getting everybody to Jesus? I'm having a hard enough time getting me to Jesus and even a harder time getting you to him. <laughs> you know? We need the Lord. And if, if there's even a spark of anything in you that says that and agrees with that, then you either better, number one, get ready. There's a crisis coming. Or start making some kind of movements towards the Lord to say, Lord, I can't produce this. I've, I love this, but it's to totally contrary to my thinking and everything else. But I'm, I'm saying, you know, I'm, look, look, I'm actually reading the word. See? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I'm going to do it for more than like two minutes and then drift off, you know? You know, your wife looks at you and goes, oh, how he meditates on the Lord. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he ain't thinking about the Lord at all. Goes, oh, yeah, I was reading the Bible. That's right. We discussed that one other time. All right, let's take a break and we'll come back. <laughs>